Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another class. Uh, let's just begin with a word of prayer. Uh, would any of us like to lead in prayer, please? Samuel, can you lead in prayer? Sure, Pastor. Right. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Uh, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for this uh, communion. We thank you for this fellowship with you. We ask you uh, to bless us with your presence, fill us with your peace that surpasses all understanding, that surpasses all knowledge. Uh, we dedicate Pastor Paul into your hands, uh, fill him with your spirit and your anointing uh, and the topics that he teaches, the insights that he brings, it affects us deeply, inspires us, motivates us, equips and builds us to further extend your kingdom. Bless everyone present on this call. Um, bless, uh, bless their fellowship, their calling, uh, their ministry. This and everything else we dedicate in your precious name. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Samuel. Okay. Uh, so before we begin... Let's, like what we do every class, let's uh, just look at uh, a quick review of what we did uh, yesterday. So yesterday we looked at the second great awakening. Uh, revival broke out in England. Uh, and then from England, it went into North America. And we also looked at examples of, uh, you know, Adoniram Judson, um, uh, John Wesley's, uh, Jonathan Edwards, all of these wonderful great men of God uh, whom God used to just spark these revivals. Now, by this time, uh, you know, the, the Roman Catholic, uh, you know, precedent or the pr prominence of the Roman Catholic Church uh, was gone because they could not stop the move of the Holy Spirit. It was too much for them to handle. Right. Uh, if you remember, initially we were looking at how, you know, they tried their best to stop people from getting the Bible. They tried their best from people to, you know, that everyone should you know, follow the Pope and everyone should be connected uh, only to the Roman Catholic uh, system. But uh, God, in such a beautiful way, raised up, you know, people within the same community. You know, example, John Calvin himself was... Uh, uh, a Catholic uh, wanting to become a priest, but God raised up these kind of leaders and used them to establish the, the, the real church, the church where the word of God, the work of the Holy Spirit uh, is, uh, you know, spread uh, most, even more stronger in different parts of the world. So in the second great awakening, revival broke out in North America, uh, you know, revival broke out in college campuses. Uh, uh, with what little that John Wesley and Charles Wesley did uh, during their lunch breaks. And uh, they would meet about 10, 20 people. That grew on to 200 people. And uh, eventually, John and Charles Wesley finished and they came out of their colleges. Uh, but that revival fire went into different parts of the world, different college campuses. And it is said that because of college campuses, Baptist churches saw about 100,000 people being added into the church. Methodist churches saw 40,000 odd people. So every denomination uh, saw an increase uh, in church membership. And then we also looked at how uh, God used missionaries, people with the, you know, the anointing, with the grace of God to leave their comforts and come into places like India, where the facilities and, uh, you know, Christianity was not even known uh, during the early 1700s. William Carey came to India, established a work here, uh, established universities, provided education, and uh, gave his life for the sake of the gospel at, uh, you know, one of his famous sayings, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. Uh, and then we also looked at missionaries going into India, Persia, Burma, and uh, a little bit of ministry into Africa, which later on uh, David Livingston takes and 
uh, you know, increases that, uh, and a little bit of ministry also in Sri Lanka by Dr. John Scudder. So we're seeing the work of the Holy Spirit. We're seeing, uh, you know, churches being established. We're seeing a revival, and all of this we've been that we've been studying. You know, we see that people did make mistakes, right? These great leaders did make mistakes, and uh, but the most important thing is all of them started small all of them were faithful to the call of god upon their lives right so it was always you know for for us even when we desire revival it's it's it has to be god first and then others you know the other things come next and we will look at uh, you know uh, at the end of this chapter we look at key observations uh, from everything that we have learned. Uh, so let's start with now the third great awakening. So we looked at the first, we looked at the second, and we look at the third great awakening. Now, again, the third great awakening uh, continued in America. Uh, even after the second great awakening, there was a war, uh, and the the churches in America did not suffer much because that still that revival fire was there it was spreading uh, so there was no decline in churches but again uh, the revival spread through scotland god used great leaders like wc burns george Mueller, uh, went into switzerland france uh, holland norway germany australia hawaii so all the parts of the world uh, revival spread uh, you know i, I always say, say this one of the most important characteristics of fire is that fire by nature spreads right it, it you by nature the the a fire will spread you can only stop it if you pour some water on it or you you know uh, uh, forcefully try to stop it but the the nature of fire it is is to spread and so we see that we see that in the second uh, uh, you know, awakening. We see that in the third awakening as well, where something that started maybe in a small city, in a small town in America or a small town in England, impacted the almost the rest of the world, where people heard, "Hey, this is what is happening in America. This is what is happening in England. This is what's happening in Wales. We want the same thing also." And so they began to pray and we see that the same kind of fire, the same kind of revival broke out in these other places of the world as well. Uh, so we will look at a few more lives of people, uh, uh, missionaries, revivalists who impacted uh, the nations in the third great awakening. All right, any questions, any thoughts that you want to share uh, before we start? Or should we go ahead? You know, uh, something that uh, I feel that each of us, each of us should take home is uh, there's a reason. If you look at your notes, there's a lot of dates. There's a lot of uh, you know uh, places that are uh, mentioned. But the whole learning for this is if if you are able to take the main you know uh, aspects of what happened in church history and you know the lives of these people uh, you know you don't have it's not necessary we have to know okay this happened in the first uh, awakening this happened in the second and this happened in the third but at least uh, you know how their lives how people were willing to give their lives how the gospel spread and how god can use you and i simple people um, uh, you know to start a revival to start an outpouring so uh, just be open to what the Holy Spirit is leading you as we uh, study all of this. Right? Uh, so let's look at Charles Finney. Uh, Charles Finney was a young man uh, at the age of 29. Uh, he became one of the most uh, you know, successful evangelists. Now, before that, he was, uh, he was a stubborn atheist. He was a lawyer in New York. And, uh, and we know that lawyers uh, had a good tongue. Right. During those days, they would say that the lawyers were one of the highest paid people 
uh, 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 during the early times. And even now, lawyers are very highly paid because of what they are able to do. Uh, and so Charles Finney was that. He was an atheist uh, practicing law. And uh, suddenly, uh, he had a, uh, a, a conversion, and he strongly began to emphasize on of being right before the presence of God, obedience before the Lord is more important. As we, you know, as even as we study the Word, as as we preach the Word, we personally need to obey the Word of God. So, uh, Finney, Charles Finney, often preached, and people began to weep. People began to mourn during his preachings. Uh, he he is the one who started new techniques in uh, evangelism, right? Where, you know, uh, the altar call, you would uh, usually what he would do is he would tell the church congregation, leave the first two rows and sit from the third row. And those who are convicted, even during the preaching, would come to the front and, uh, you know, uh, they would weep and they would moan. And so he was open to all of that. And then he also did salvation call. He would say after preaching, those who want to give their life to Christ, come in front and uh, like an altar call. So he was the one who started it. Charles Finney was the one who started this whole thing uh, and, and a public invitation to accept Jesus as their personal savior. Uh, so he did all of this. Uh, there was a mixed response. Some people said, okay, is this all required? Uh, and some people said, okay, this is good. You know, it's good to uh, make this decision in the presence of people, in the presence of the Lord. And But one thing happened. There were amazing healings. There were amazing signs. There were wonders, miracles. Uh, lawyers, doctors, professionals all began to give their life to Christ. The entire uh, college's came under conviction. Now, what's happening is this, the lecturers uh, and all these lawyers and theologians and all of them are under deep conviction. And now they go into their workplaces and they are teaching students. St students are getting convicted. Uh, Bible studies are starting in these places and altar calls are being made. Thousands of lives are coming into Christ. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, revival fires spread all across about 1,500 towns and villages in New England uh, saw the move of the Holy Spirit. Right? Communities were trans transformed. Uh, like we also saw uh, in the previous Second Great Awakening, lawyers didn't have any work. Uh, the police didn't have any work. Crime was at its low. Uh, prayer meeting went on for days. Uh, and, and so we see that uh, prayer and revival and uh, you know all these meetings, church meetings uh, became very, very prominent uh, in the whole of uh, uh, England. And then we look at that same revival, a young man named Edward Irving, uh, he was a pastor of a church. He read about what's happening in England and uh, and this is in Scotland, Edward Irving, he had a small congregation, about 50 people. He said, I want this. So he began to pray with his uh, church team of about 10 people every day, day and night. They had like a, you know, those chain prayers. And he began to study the book of Acts. And he said, he told the church, uh, we need to study and we need to prepare and uh, uh, prepare ourselves for a move of God. What happened in the book of Acts can happen now as well. And when he began, you know, probably in a couple of months, his congregation grew from 50 people to 1,000 people. Just in a few months, uh, there was a manifestation of tongues, there was prophecies, there was healings. And here's the interesting thing. In Scotland, lay people, meaning just regular church members began to exercise gifts. And, uh, they began to speak in tongues. They began to pray for the sick and the sick were healed. Uh, the, the, those who were uh, working professionals began to have prayer meetings. And, uh, and you know, it, there was no more like an emphasis of you have to be a pastor, you have to be a, a theologian, or you have to be a prophet and all of those things. It began where... You know, even lay people began to preach the word of God and God began to move in, in their midst. But 
uh, a lot of these other denominational churches felt that uh, it's not right. They felt that it should they should be only ordained priests and ministers who and pastors, uh, ordained pastors to look after the work of God. But uh, uh, this could not be stopped in Scotland because God was moving and uh, regular lay people were, you know, doing great works, exercising demons. And uh, uh, but here's the thing. What happened was because of, uh, you know, inappropriate teaching or lack of teaching, uh, there was a lot of damage. There was a lot of fleshly manifestations of the work of the Holy Spirit. People started to, you know, rely on their own flesh, uh, uh, false prophecies. People started, uh, you know, saying things like, you know, uh, the end is coming. And, and all of those, you know, those end time kind of prophets came up. And, uh, and so there was a bit of damage done uh, by this uh, whole thing in Scotland. Yet, uh, it did not, you know, the whole thing of uh, lay people serving and uh, lay people preaching, it did not die out. It continued to spread. And through this, uh, a lot of uh, missionaries were birthed. So working professionals said, okay, we want to work. We also want to go and do missions. So there were people, what they would do is in the early 1800s, they would work for six months. You know, look after their families and all of it, save up money, save up uh, a former team. And the next six months, they would go on missions. So they would go to different countries. So, so this became a pattern. Six months work, six months go on missions. So uh, it was good because what happened was, uh, if you see earlier on uh, and even later on, but uh, most of these missionaries were sent by missionary organizations who depended on income from these organizations. But here, uh, from this whole lay men revival, what happened was those working professionals did not depend on anyone. So they chose places, they went wherever they wanted to. Some went into Germany, China, um, and the work of God, uh, a charismatic outbreak. Uh, happen, which means, uh, you know, the signs, wonders, miracles, exercising of gifts, uh, you know, uh, all of these things uh, took place in different parts of Scotland. And it went on into Germany. Crowds grew from 15,000 people in attendance to about uh, 40,000, 50,000 people um, uh, attended meetings. Uh, prayer meetings would go on for two years. So they would call it prayer camps. So they would just come, meet, have songs, pray. And that went on for two years. And after that, 70% uh, of uh, Germany was already converted. They were already believers, uh, saved, uh, and they were already work, walking in uh, the word of God, and they were already part of a local church. Missionaries were sent out from there. So it all started by just those 50 people who began to pray, or those 10 people who began to pray uh, in that 50 people church congregation. Went on to 1,000 people. That 1,000 people went on to bring revival into Germany, into Hawaii, and different, different places as well. So again, very important point is small beginnings. Right? Uh, uh, I forget the verse, but in Zechariah it says, never despise small beginnings. Right? Uh, especially we as, you know, sometimes God makes us go through seasons. God makes us go through, uh, you know, a waiting period, a training period. Uh, I remember this uh, time when, uh, you know, I joined Bible college many years back, 2011. Uh, and when I joined, I always thought, okay, I want to preach. I want to be in the church. I wanted to do this. I want to do that. Uh, after Bible college, uh, just got into a, a role in the church. and uh, But in my heart, I always wanted to do it, you know, to preach in church and to teach the word of God. But God took me through this whole period of you know, training in the small things. Right? It was only after four years that I got an opportunity uh, to you know preach 
the word of God in a church, right? Now, I'm not saying that, you know, you have to go through a waiting period. No, God sometimes, you know, immediately can plant you in a place where you can just begin your whole ministry and, you know, things may just go on well. Uh, but for most of the times, God takes us through those seasons of small beginnings, small beginnings. Right. Uh, even in, in in the city of Mangalore, when we moved to Mangalore, uh, the church was about 10 or 12 of us uh, in the church, not more than that, 12 of us. Uh, and, you know, we would have worship evenings and, uh, you know, if the worship evening is at five o'clock uh, till about 5.30, no one would turn up. And, uh, uh, you know, sometimes there was just one of us or sometimes nobody just me and my wife and my kids just all of us and so we there were times we just did one hour of worship with just four of us closed the shed and went home there are times when uh, there was nobody just me so I, I just sang for one hour there was nobody in the congregation uh, nobody came for the worship evening uh, this empty church to empty chairs uh, shared the word to empty chairs close the shed came back home and I thought about all, you know, you think about all this and you say, God, why is it not happening? Uh, but here's the thing. We are to be faithful in those small seasons. And then after a few months, we began to see, uh, you know, a work of God. God began to bring in families. God began to bring in students. And uh, the church is so wonderfully growing now. Uh, we have about 100 odd people in the church now. Uh, uh, just before the pandemic, uh, we had about 100 odd people. So what I'm trying to say is we may all be part of a ministry or we may want to start our own ministry. Uh, be ready for small beginnings. Not everything is going to be easy, right? Uh, uh, sometimes we look at the end picture, right? Uh, and we feel, oh, I wish I can do this. I wish I was that. Uh, but it's always good to remember the starting phases also, right? So when God takes us uh, and he has a call for us, be willing to take on uh, those small those small beginnings, small responsibilities. It starts small. Uh, and then we, we grow up the ladder. So, uh in most cases of what we've been studying, it all started off small. John Wesley, the, the whole Methodist movement was John Wesley and his brother, two of them. Jo Charles Wesley used to play the uh, keyboard and then John used to come and preach. And there were times if we study the Methodist and how it came into being, John and Charles would you know, sit together and pray. And the, his people, his friends and all of them would say, what are these two brothers uh, called? They were actually initially, uh, I don't know if it's there in the notes, but they were called uh, the brothers of uh, brother trouble or some, something like that they were called. So people really mocked them. Um, and it was a very small beginning. But who knew that, the, that you know, through John and Charles Wesley, uh, a whole knew you know the methodist movement would start um where the move of god was so powerful missionaries sent out from the methodist movement who knew that charles wesley's uh, songs would be sung even now in the 21st century uh, it all started small and through faithfulness right so after all uh, after that we see that uh about a young man named George Mueller. I don't know if you've read about this book. Uh, uh, the name of the book itself is uh, George Mueller, a man of faith. Uh, George Mueller was a German Christian and uh, God called him with a different, a little bit of a different calling as compared to others. Uh, God called him to help the poor and the orphan children. And so he moved to uh, England and Bristol and Muller and his wife started off caring for 30 girls in a rented house and established an orphanage. Uh, he, what he did was he never asked people for money. He never raised funds. He was never funded. And he was known as a man of prayer and a man of faith, right? And he, through all of this, without even asking for money, he established 117 schools uh, without any fundraising, without any 
uh, you know, uh, asking for funds from anyone. He, he was a simple man, but he had great faith in God. Imagine you've got, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, hundreds of children and he's not, uh, you know, he's not funded by anyone. But here's the thing, what George Mueller would do, he would pray. Day and night he would pray uh, that God, you will provide. Uh, there are plenty of instances uh, where children have, you know, there's no food. He's made the children sit down and with their plates and everything. And he said, thank God for the food that he has given us. And the workers in the kitchen are saying, there is no food. Uh, what is he talking about? Uh, say, thank God for the food. So the children would pray and say, thank you, God, for the food that you've given us. And at that moment, there was a knock on the door and uh, a baker came and said, you know, I've made extra bread uh, for some reason and it's going for a waste. So I came to give everyone and he gives the bread. And just after the baker goes, uh, a milkman, uh, you know, pushing his cart, the, the cart breaks down right in front of the orphanage and the milkman says, I cannot waste this milk. Please take all of the milk uh, for the orphanage. And so in this way, God provided plenty of times for George Mueller. Time and again, God proved his faithfulness uh, to this man. But here's what George Mueller did. Uh, he impacted those children's lives. It is said that through him, he would teach these children about God and teach them the word of God. And as they grow up, he would release them into mission fields. Many of them, uh, it's not documented, but many of them became pastors, became missionaries, uh, you know, just by looking at the life of George Mueller, a man of faith. And, uh, and, and, and then we see that, uh, you know, prayer is what sustained his ministry. And, uh, after that, we look at a man named William Ch Chalmers Burns. He's known as W.C. Burns. Now, this is a very interesting story. Uh, I'll backtrack uh, maybe a, about 10 years before this. What happened was, there, it's not in your notes. So uh, there was this man named Robert Murray McShane, uh, a young man. He started a, you know, a, a church in Scotland. And... Um, Robert Mary McShane was deeply inspired by the, you know, the revival that happened in America by Jonathan Edwards, David Brainard, the life of all of these people. So Robert Mary McShane said, I want to see revival in, in my church. He had about 50 people in his church. And so he began to pray day after day after day with his team, with his prayer partners and prayer team in church. And uh, he was a man of deep prayer. He said, God, send revival in, from this church. Let it go into different parts of the world. And after 10 years also, nothing happened. Right? He was getting old. He had an accident. And he had to go on a sabbatical, which means he had to go on a, a leave, on a health leave. So they had to find somebody else to... You know, by this time, the church was about 100 odd people. That's it, about 100. So they had to find somebody to replace Robert Mary McShane. And so at that time, they find a young man named W.C. Burns, right? A very young man. And, and so he comes into the church. Now, W.C. Burns only thought, okay, I'll come. I'll preach the word. It's a church. Uh, so I think I can do this. And so he began to preach. But what happened? All of a sudden, there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What was 100 people grew to 500, grew to 1,000, grew to 2,000, 5,000. At one point of time, there were 10,000 people in the church. Now, W.C. Burns is a young man. He's somewhere around 28, 29. He has no idea what's happening. He just thought, okay, 100 people in the church, I'll come and, you know, just pray and uh, do the church, you know, lead the church. Uh, he was passionate about it, but he did not expect this kind of thing. Uh, so when Robert Mary McShane was away, he, he, you know, he writes a letter and says, please come, I don't know what is happening in the church. The church is growing. I'm not able to handle uh, what is happening. And when Robert Mary McShane the, comes back and sees the church, he realizes that God has started 
a revival from the church. The church grew to 10,000, later on 15,000 people. And later on, uh, W.C. Burns was so impressed by this whole uh, thing of, you know, the move of God in this church. And he said, if God is able to do it here, God can also do it in different parts of the world. So he decided he wanted to set sail to China and uh, spread the gospel uh, in uh, in British Hong Kong. So he goes into China. Uh, he meets with Hudson Taylor, and we'll talk about Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China. He meets with uh, Hudson Taylor there. Together they work in the interior cities and jungles of uh, China, many lives being touched. And Hudson Taylor himself says, W.C. Burns was a man of prayer. His 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 prayer life was so deep uh, that uh, you know uh, we could not cope up to his spiritual fervor, his spiritual strength that he had. And so, one of the important lessons that we can learn, you know, each of us can learn through this story, is that you know Paul writes to the Corinthians. He says, "Somebody sows." Somebody else waters, and God brings the harvest. Right? So uh, somebody sows the seed, somebody else waters the seed, God brings the harvest. Right? So here, Robert Murray McShane, he sowed the seed. W.C. Burns just watered those seeds, and there was an outpouring. So if we are praying for an outpouring of God, maybe some of us have, you know, it's come across my mind as well, where I feel, okay, God, we are praying for revival all across our city, all across our nation. We've been praying and praying and praying, uh, but we haven't seen it yet. You know, uh, here's the thing. God can use you to plant the seed, which later on, uh, somebody else will water and God will make that uh, seed, that fruit to grow and to spread in different parts of the world, right? So never be discouraged uh, with what you have, right? Uh, never be discouraged with what you've started with. Uh, I don't know if I've said this, but uh, uh, it was uh, John Wesley who said this many years back, great doors open on small hinges, right? Or big doors open on small hinges. No matter how big your door is, you can have a twenty foot, uh, twenty feet door, uh, but the hinges are just going to be about four to five inches. Right? Uh, so big doors open on small hinges, uh, and and we see here that we may not always see the revival. If we see it, great, thank God for it, that we are part of the revivals. Uh, but if we don't see it, Continue to trust God that the future generation uh, will see a move of God. And even now, when we, you know, when we look around, uh, what's happening? Uh, we need an outpouring. Maybe God is using us to be prayer, you know, prayer prayer warriors for that future revival that He's going to pour out. Right. Uh, so we need to have faith in that. And, uh, we, the moment we think, okay. Uh, I'm just, a, you know, I'm just 20 people in a small village in a church. Uh, what impact can I do? Uh, when we think that way, uh, you know, it's like a hindrance to revival. Uh, we need to think, God, just 20 people is what I have. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Use us, just 20 people in the church. Use us to bring an impact in our city, in our nation. Right? Uh, so it's a wonderful learning. This is a wonderful learning. We may be praying for something. We may not see it, but the seeds are sown. Uh, God will bring in people to water it, and God will bring it to uh, harvest as well. For example, the next person that we're going to talk about is David Livingston. All of us know about David Livingston. Uh, David Livingston was a missionary to Africa, and he was a pioneering medical missionary. Right, uh, his grandfather. Now he grew up in his grandfather's house, Neil Livingston. It's not in your notes. It's, uh, and Neil Livingston, he was a Sunday school teacher, but David Livingston was a very, very intellectual person. He said all he wanted to do was explore. Yeah, 
he was not bothered about god and all of that he said, i wanted to he wanted to explore uh, things around uh, he wanted to explore new uh, you know uh, medicine he wanted to uh, he was more of a pioneer right uh, so he wanted to travel to many places uh, he wanted people to you know always look up to him Uh, so when he went into africa what he did was uh, this is a real story where he wanted the tribes of africa to believe he was like a like a great man or a, or a god that is coming to uh, you know africa so what he did was uh, he you know in africa the lions would come and eat the sheep and the, the cattle and the, so the the people living there would say uh, oh the lions are uh, you know uh, causing so much trouble only if god can come and uh, you know get rid of them they've killed so many of us so david livingston he actually took a troop of these africans in his first visit to africa he took these troops and he said come let's go and catch the lions and so he went uh, and when they when he saw a lion face to face he panicked and he didn't know what to do and he he tried to shoot the lion and the lion did not even die and it chased him and he got injured on his hand right and his left hand was injured uh, he couldn't raise his hand till his death he had that uh, problem uh, you know of the hand but the reason i'm saying this i'm telling you the story is because he was not inclined towards god he wanted people to recognize him he wanted to abolish slavery he wanted to uh, you know he wanted to do good things but not in the name of god but later on there was uh, some kind of a conviction that happened into him and he felt that you know uh, for people to honor him for people to listen to him it was not through all of his talents and through all the knowledge that he had he knew that he needed god to you know to move in this place of africa and so he he you know he in africa he gave his life to christ he rededicated his life to christ and then uh, he did an intensive work he went to many many places preaching sharing the gospel uh, and all he did was he said my reward is not here my reward is in heaven uh, he went to east africa he went into the deepest jungles of africa he said that you know david livingston feared nobody right uh, you know there were times when now uh, there's this article uh, where it mentions that uh, you know people came with spears and they put the spear on david livingston's neck uh, like you know three four spears all on the neck and they said if you don't stop preaching we're going to push this spear and he didn't flinch at all he said please wait let me finish the sermon and then you do what you have to do he was so you know uh, bold and so powerful uh, there were there were sto- there are stories that the african tribal leaders uh, would say if if nothing happens through our gods and you know if anybody was sick or anything if nothing happens after praying to our god just go and meet the foreigner and he will pray and i think uh, you know our, our child will be restored so there are many testimonies of that and what david livingston did was he he was able to uh, not abolish slavery but he was able to uh, bring a, some kind of a, 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 you know a, 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 by saying that slavery is something wrong he brought the word of god in and so even when people from uh, england or america would come uh you know usually those days they would come they would buy slaves from africa and go back but it is said that you know a lot of americans who came to africa uh they came in the intention to buy land buy slaves and all of it uh but they went back saved uh, uh and you know saved by the gospel of jesus christ so uh david livingston did a wonderful work and when he died he wanted to always be buried in africa itself and that's what happened as well so missionary work began to spread in africa as well uh so we see here that you know david livingston he wanted to do something for the wrong reasons right uh but he realized that you know if if he has to do if he has to be fruitful it has to be through god 
and as I was preparing this, I was reminded of the verse in the book of John, where he says that, where Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Uh, if you are not connected to the vine, the branch will not bear any fruit. Right? Uh, and, and if we are not connected to Jesus and we try to do things, we may bear fruit in the natural, but what here we're talking about is spiritual fruit in the sense that our, our ministry or our spiritual life will bear fruit. Right? So David Livingston tried to do things on his own, uh, but it didn't work out. He had to go back, dedicated his life to Christ. Then he made a powerful impact uh, in East of Africa and entire Africa as well. All right. Uh, any questions, any thoughts, any of you have? I know I've been speaking. Uh, uh, any questions, any thoughts? Yes, Samuel, go ahead. Um, also something that you briefly touched upon um, uh, is the war. Like alongside all of these revivals, there are also a lot of wars that happened. Um, so as I was thinking about this, I, I'm not sure how significant it is because uh, at least um, you know something that uh, the Christian community often faces huge criticism about uh, is these wars that happened, especially in the 16 and 1700s. So, I mean, uh, while I think, so I, I don't know, so I, I don't know the purpose of studying the wars or even all the casualties, but um, I, I definitely with the purpose of revivals, you know, it's, um, it's definitely to get an understanding of how God could prepare us for the coming revivals. But I'm thinking in retrospective, you know, um, what would be the use of studying the wars and Especially, I think, um, whenever we face circumstances where uh, all these wars are brought about and, uh, and criticized, um, and how do we kind of uh, respond? Yeah, thank you, Samuel. Uh, yeah, so Samuel, if, if you notice that, uh, you know, in most of these places in the First Awakening, we only said, you know, the war of 1812 to 1815. There's a reason we didn't, you know, go deep into you know what happened in that war and all, because that's not what we want to study, you know, because what happened was the early 1700s, the 1800s saw the revolution, industrialization, right? Uh, 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 printing presses. So business was at its high. Now, since business was at its high, there were there were also other countries trying to gain prominence over other, uh, you know, different countries. So America wanted uh, parts of England. England said no. And then Germany wanted parts of uh, America. And, and so these constant wars were happening, right? So the, there is a reason why we didn't go into those wars because they, those wars were not not so towards the Christian. It was not because, okay, there's Christians and we need to, you know, uh, uh, you know, try to disrupt what they're doing. But this was more on the other side of the spectrum in the sense that uh, what we are looking at is the ministry side. Uh, but on the other side, life was normal, like we said, right? Uh, businesses were there, working professionals, coal minings, uh, you know, industries. They were all open. They were all functioning. New York had its, uh, uh, the greatest towers in 800. In the 1800s had a whole tower, uh, and it was known as the lawyer's paradise, you know. So any lawyer, if you're in New York, you're a lawyer, you're doing well. So, so the wars was simply that uh, there were certain wars that did affect the church because there was a lot of death. There was... Uh, like we saw in the uh, uh, first awakening after the wars, uh, the you know the the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit was dampened. Why? Because people saw death. People uh, now, when we say wars, it was it would have been just you know uh, uh, dead bodies lying everywhere, uh, children dead, families dead. Now it was a mental kind of a uh, torture to these people. Uh, so. So yes, Samuel, that's the reason why we're not going deep into those wars. But if you see in the Second Great Awakening, uh, after the Second Great Awakening, there was a war. Uh, but that war did not affect uh, any of the churches. Right? So in the sense that churches still began to grow, 
churches still began to worship God after that. So, uh, so if your question is why are the walls mentioned, uh, it is only to for us to know that even in those times of challenges, even in those times of difficulties, uh, the church stood still, the church stood strong. Uh, and, and the whole thing was that God did not let, you know, the church to die off. So, and yes, I know. The particular war, like, especially because of all of these rivers, like, for example, I think, um, I'm not too sure, but uh, I think it's Ireland. Uh, often when you read uh, Ireland about Ireland and the Irish thing, uh, I think there's a lot of movies also where uh, the Protestants versus Catholics. I think that war lasted for quite some time, and and that you know affected a lot. So I'm, I'm especially talking about wars, uh, not the other wars because of any other political wars, but mainly because of uh, I think the uh, Christian versus Protestants. I mean Catholics versus Protestants. That uh, the war and those casualties, uh, you know, it's like. Alongside the revivals that's happening. Yes. Because, yeah, those. Yes, you're right. You're right, Samuel. That that is right. The you know one of the things between Catholics and Protestants is always that whole thing of you know what happened. It is. I think it has left a mark on Christendom, right? Uh, because Catholics and the Protestants, the Protestants were known as Protestants because they protested against what the Roman Catholic was doing. Uh, Yes, so there was definitely uh, an effect on the church, right? Uh, there was definitely an effect on the church. That is the whole reason why new denominations also came up. Uh, basically, the intention of now we're not putting down the I don't want to put down the Roman Catholic Church. There's nothing against them, uh, but basically their whole uh, you know idea was to get every Christian needs to be you know, into in their fold, right? They have to be under the Pope. So that was the, the, the whole thing was, we are in control. Uh, and so that is why the Protestants came to say, no, you are not in control because it's God's word. It is justification by faith and it's not through what you're doing. So those wars did have a lasting impression on people. Many, like if you go deeper into church history, many of them did not come into Christianity because of all of this. And many of them just left the faith because of all of these wars. Many of them were confused. So, you know, what, what do I do? Here's the Pope and he's saying, do this. And here this side, they're saying, no, you don't have to. And if I don't follow the Pope, or don't become a Catholic, I try to do something on my own, uh, they're going to you know, kill me and I'll be martyred. And so I have a family, I have children, I don't want to be martyred. So you know, there was this uh, division within the church. Uh, and that's what we saw in, you know, just at the early uh, parts of uh, church history that, you know, the Romans did all they could to take complete control. But praise God for, uh, you know, these movements, the, these great people who stood, they were willing to give their lives uh, for the sake of the gospel. Uh, uh, but these tensions, even now, I'm, uh, we are not looking at the side of where uh, the Roman Catholics, you know, they they persecuted the Protestants and the Methodists and all of that. We're not looking at that part, but I'm sure even in the 1800s, uh, there was constant persecution from the Roman Catholic Church. It was there. It was only that they could not stop it because God, the work of God, was moving. It was it was too much for them to stop. Right. So, uh, but I'm sure there was persecution. There was, uh, you know, oppression from the Roman Catholic Church. And that continues on, even in the early 1900s. When we look at the 1900s, uh, all of a sudden, uh, the Roman Catholic Church makes some rules and all of that. We see that later on. So, yes, it did impact uh, uh, the church as a whole. Yeah. Thank you, Samuel, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Charles says, now, when you're talking about David Livingston, you're talking about East Africa. He was here. We studied about him in history in school. He came here in Uganda, but later went to Southern Africa countries where he died. His two servants were called. Oh, OK. Thank you, Charles, for that information. Yes, uh, he, he, he basically started off in East Africa. And uh, then his ministry went on to different parts 
of Africa. It's nice to know that uh, about his servants and um, yeah, uh, because the the other thing is most of these revivalists were intensely traveling. They you know they went to different places. Many of them went through persecutions. Like uh, David Livingston himself was attacked by a lion. So many of them died through sicknesses and diseases and lack of medical aid and. Uh, so I'm sure most of them, like, for example, John Wesley also later on had many servants to help him because he could not even move. Uh, uh, Charles Wesley is said to have had many servants to help him to, you know, uh, just make him sit on the piano so that he could play and write songs. And uh, so, yes, many of the revivalists would have gone through a lot of physical ailments uh, during their time of ministry. So. Okay, so let's stop here. Um, uh, I just hope that each of us are, you know, stirred in our hearts, even as we study this. I know it's a lot of information, but uh, it's really interesting to, you know, learn from their lives, and uh, you know, it helps us to, uh, you know, pursue God, to look to God even more. So, so we will stop here. We will continue from next week. Uh, uh, would any of us like to just close in prayer? Any of us can close in prayer. Abraham, if you're around, can you please close in prayer? Okay, anybody, uh, just go ahead, close in prayer. Father, we thank you for what we've learned. Father, we thank you for the great history of the church. And that today we know that revival is possible, just as it was in the former days. We believe, Lord, it will happen in the latter days. Lord, we believe for your outpouring of your Holy Spirit, just as the early church saw your outpouring. We will continue to pray and lift our hearts and our feet. Lord, help us, Lord. Lord, help our unbelief. Help us to develop great faith in you and apply what we have learned, Father. Thank you. Thank you that we know this can be possible in this dispensation. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. And we continue in the pursuit of revival. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much, Taisha. Thank you all for joining. Uh, have a wonderful week ahead. We'll see you next week. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Be blessed. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. God bless.